Okay, welcome back. Next up is Sammy Kamkar. He's a security researcher. He's best known for creating the MySpace worm, one of the fastest spreading viruses of all time. He's using typical hardware for surreptitious means, such as Wi-Fi. Yeah. Yes. All sorts of stuff. Yeah. All sorts of stuff. Okay. He's also exposed issues around privacy, such as developing the Ever Cookie, which appeared in a top secret NASA document revealed by Edward Snowden. So let's give a round of applause for Sammy Kamkar. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Oh, man, I'm so excited to be here. Um, I've learned so much from you all, from the Hackaday community. I'm, I'm traditionally a software person, and uh, I keep seeing people do such cool stuff with hardware, and I've always been so jealous. Um, I still am. I love, uh, so I see so many cool projects on Hackaday, um, and I've learned a ton, so I'm here to share some cool stuff. Uh, Chris said we're supposed to be talking about making stuff, so we might talk about breaking stuff, too. I hope that's okay. Who likes to break stuff? Yes, yes, all right. All right, so we'll just dive right in. I have a lot of stuff to cover. Um, research. I just want to talk about how I get into, uh, if I'm investigating something new, if I want to break into something, if I want to create a tool to exploit something. We're going to be talking about how to create tools to exploit vulnerabilities. Um, the first thing is research. Uh, who, Google. Google is your best friend, right? There's so much out there that you can find, that you can, you know, there's giants out there that we can uh, sit on their shoulders and use their existing, um, use their existing research and information. Um, some other things. If you're looking at hardware, which we're all looking at hardware here, tear it down. Open it up. You know, get the screws out. Get your heat gun out. Open it up and understand what's going on inside. If you have no idea what's going on inside, that's okay. Look. Over time, you'll st start to see patterns, as I'm sure you all do. Um, prior art, as I said, does the same thing as Google. Uh, ben Krasno had an amazing talk earlier and covered pat patents. Look at patents. There's so much amazing information in patents. Uh, just don't read the claims, because then you'll get sued, apparently. Uh, if you're talking about RF or radio frequency, uh, look up the FCC ID. So in the US, anything that transmits, they need to put an FCC ID identifier on there. And from public records, you can get information about that. And we'll take a look at that. Uh, RF networking, if, you're, if it's networking or Wi-Fi, sniff it. There are sniffers available, very inexpensive tools. And that's another thing that's really important to me, inexpensive tools, things that anyone can afford, right? Any kid in their basement or room can just like, get for $10 or $20 on Amazon and do so much with. Um, if the circuit is available, and sometimes FCC has the circuit available, you'll actually see schematics inside of FCC documents for devices. Learn the circuit. Um, if there are chips on board, figure out what those chips do. If you don't know what the chip is, if it doesn't have a name, we'll figure out how to, how to get that stuff, how to figure that stuff out. Um, if there's onboard flash, oh man, there's so much cool stuff you can do with, with uh, with hardware. If there's onboard flash, you can dump it. You can actually extract firmware. Look for test points. We'll look for those. Um, it will look for uh, uh, JTAG pins. If it's flash protected, you can actually glitch it. Chip Whisper is an amazing tool that's been featured on Hackaday several times. And you can use that to glitch power, clock. Um, you can dump the flash, and then you can take that software, and you can put it into a disassembler to see exactly what instructions are being executed on that piece of hardware. You can take secrets from hardware. Uh, so this was a, a project I did recently where I got a new Amex card. Uh, they, I lost my card and they sent me a new one. And I always had the card number written down. And the number looked a lot like my, other, my previous card. And I had like four other cards previous, prior to that. So I looked back at my logs of all the credit card numbers and they followed a sequence. I was like, what? Maybe I can predict the next one before it comes. So I started looking into what is a mag stripe? How does it work? Um, and I was like, it can't, be a ma it can't be magnetic. It can't be actually magnetic, can it? And I found out it's actually magnetic. So I got a bunch of iron oxide filings, and I put my credit card in to see, like, is there a way that we can actually see what's happening? And you can. You can actually read the literally the bits off of my credit card and go purchase stuff right now. So if you want, yeah, that's my credit card. Go use it. You can actually read every single bit. Those are zeros and ones. The thin and the, the thick are zeros and ones. You can read that with the naked eye. Absolutely incredible. And I thought, if I can get that data, or let's say I know my credit card, and I can figure out what the next credit card is, couldn't I write, create my own credit card? Well, I don't know how to create a credit card. But I, now that I understand that it's magnetic, can I just create a magnet or an electromagnet? How does electromagnets work? Very simple. It's a coil and energy. All you need to do is give energy into a wire 
like magnet wire that I have here, and here I use an AT Tiny controller, basically an AVR or mini Arduino, and I power a motor driver that just turns the coil on and off or reverses polarity. That produces an electromagnetic field so that we can actually go up to any credit card reader, not NFC, not RFID, and put this device, press a button, and it uses a credit card. It actually plays whatever you want. It's so simple. And as I'm doing this, who, who's actually put, uh, put their, swipe their credit card and says insert chip? Who's done that? And it's like, you swipe, no, you need to insert chip. And they do that for security because the chip is so much more protected. So how does it know that you have a chip on the card? The magnetic stripe tells it. <laughs> so my card has a chip, but I just flip the bit from one, has chip, to zero, no chip. So now I can go to Target, swipe, or just use this device, and it doesn't require the chip. This is security. This is our security day. It's incredible. Uh, who likes Nicolas Cage? Yes, all right, me too. I, I want to be just like him. Um, so I've done, a, I've done a ton of like car research. Uh, and this is a garage, and I have a garage. I was like, how does it work? I don't understand how garages work. I need to press the button and it opens. So let's, let's learn about that. So I quickly learned from the amazing just community out there that it uses radio frequency. Um, and radio frequency in the US, as I mentioned, if, you have, if you're transmitting, there must be an FCC ID. Everyone, if you pull out your phone, you will see an FCC ID, because your phone transmits. And you can look that up on FCC.io, um, a friend's website, and you can then get everything about that device, because it gets tested by the FCC first before it gets uh, released. So here we can see that my garage clicker actually runs on 390 megahertz. So now I know the frequency. So now if I want to sniff that or transmit on that, I know exactly what I need to get, or at least I know the frequency band I need to be in, 390 megahertz. Um, as we go through the FCC documents, these are public test reports that all of us have access to. Anyone can go and see, okay, this is the modulation type. You can see the frequency. You can see the power supply for it. Um, there are even pictures, so you can get a schematic. So if you don't even have the device in your hands, you can see what's inside. It's incredible. Um, tools that I like to use that are inexpensive, HackRF by Michael Osman. Michael Osman is amazing. He works on such, uh, such great tools that are low cost and readily available for all of us. Um, RTL SDR, HackRF is like 300 bucks. RTL SDR is maybe $15 on Amazon. Granted, it, it doesn't transmit, and it has a much uh, lower frequency range, but it's a great starter thing if you, want to, if you want to get interested in radio frequency, which is absolutely incredible. There's so much to be researched and so much you can do with it. Um, it's an amazing tool. Uh, some open source and free software, I like to use GQRX. Uh, SDR Sharp is a Windows version, essentially. RTLFM is the open source sort of uh, command line based stuff. So if you want to quickly grab radio frequency information. Um, you know, as we go through the FCC test report, we can sort of see what my garage sends. Like, what if I want to try to open my garage with my own device or create a device that does that? Well, the test report can show us a little bit more about it. Um, we have modulation schemes. We won't get too much into this. Uh, I used an RTL SDR to record my garage clicker to see what is it actually sending. And I saw that the bits, if you have a garage clicker like that, you have bits in there. And I record it with the RTL SDR. I open that file. It creates a WAV file, put in Audacity, and I actually see the bits matching up, right? The widths are basically ones are, are thick and zeros are thin. And that matches up with my garage. It's like, that's incredible. So I, as long as I can just transmit that, I can open my garage with my own device. It's like, that's weird. This is only 10 bits. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 2, 2, 6, 5, 12, 10, 24 possible combinations to open a garage. So can we brute force that? Um, yes. <laughs> So it takes 30 minutes to open virtually any fixed code garage just by brute forcing, if you just want to send every possible code. And as I was looking through it, I was like, actually, my clicker is sending the same code multiple times over and over and over again. What if I shortened it? What if I got rid of the wait? Because it's just repeating pattern. If I get rid of the wait, it continues to work. I was like, that's really interesting. So I can get it down to three minutes if I get rid of all the wait times. Well, how does it know where one code begins and one, one ends and one begins? So I tried sending my code, but I prepended a bit before and, prepend and appended a bit after. So it should be a 12-bit code that's incorrect, but the garage still opened. It's like, what? So it must be using a shift register, where it's basically, let's say if you send 11 bits and the code is 10 bits and the first bit is incorrect, it takes in the first 10 bits, it tests it, and says, is this correct? No. And then instead of get ri getting rid of the 10 bits, it shifts one off, pulls in the next one. So you just tested two 10-bit codes by sending in 11 bits. Um, that means there's some, uh, an amazing mathematician named De Bruyne created the sequence where you can take any string of numbers and produce 
uh, every possible iteration or permutation of a sequence of digits in the shortest possible amount where they actually are like uh, overlaid. So if I send 101, that's 10 zero and 01. Um, so by doing this, we can actually perform an attack that opens every fixed code garage in eight seconds. Eight <laughs> seconds for garages. Um, this is absolutely incredible. So I wanted to test it. How do we actually apply this? How do we see if it works? So if we can use existing tools, do. Use any tool that you can get your hands on. There's lots of inexpensive tools that you can do really cool stuff with. Um, what are the inputs, you know, what are the inputs and what are the outputs? The output here is 390 megahertz. We know we need to transmit that. Um, and don't worry about the final implementation. I usually test something with sort of uh, test equipment. Yardstick One, another awesome device by Michael Osman. RFCAD is an open source tool I use. Another amazing tool, the Mattel IM Me. I think we all have one of these. So some hackers have actually found that, you, that this has a really cool chip inside, a CC1110. Um, and it's a sub gigahertz uh, transceiver with, with, an, with a microcontroller, with an 8051. So you can actually, people have hacked it. Uh, Michael Osman actually wrote a spectrum analyzer for it. So you can see between about 200 megahertz and one gigahertz with this device. And you can also transmit with it. Um, so I modified it using GoodFet, another open source tool that allows you to quickly uh, write firmware and dump firmware from various devices. And by doing that, this is just a, a garage I went up to <laughs> with the open sesame. Under eight seconds. This is the security in, our, in, in what we have. But this amazing tool, this uh, IME is so cool. It has backlight, it has a keyboard, and you can get it, on, you can get it for 15 bucks on eBay. Uh, amazing. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, of course, I, I released the source, but I bricked it because I didn't want people's garages being open, right? I, I don't think that's cool. But I did want to demonstrate what the attack, attack is so people could learn how to prevent it. So I bricked the source, released it, and the next day the prices shot up a little bit. So they're now a little more expensive. Um, but fortunately, you can build your own. Right? You can actually, you know, all of this is actually very simple and there's amazing tools out there and amazing systems. And I know very little about electronics and hardware. I, I use all the basic stuff that I started. You know, someone, someone handed me an Arduino a few years ago and th they said, you can blink a light with this. And I was like, what? And I was so afraid of hardware because I'm, I've always been a software person. And I blinked a light and it was like two lines of code. And I was like, what? You can do software on this? So I stick to Arduino. I use the very basic stuff I can. Um, if I need something more advanced, I go to Teensy. Um, if I can use a Mattel toy, I'll try to program that if I can. Um, RF transmitters, when I'm looking to transmit on RF, I just Google RF transmitter 315 megahertz and I find a bunch of stuff from Adafruit, SparkFun, um, TI. And from there you can build, a, this is a, I think Hackaday had like a one inch contest. I found out about it after the fact, but I created a one inch Arduino based sub gigahertz transceiver. So you can now take this device and basically perform all sorts of sub gigahertz RF attacks. So now that we've opened the garage, we're in, someone's, uh, we're in someone's garage and we can access their vehicle. So what kind of vehicle stuff can we do? Now vehicles have all sorts of really, really interesting things. Um, everyone has a key fob, right? You can kind of unlock, lock your door. How does that work? So first, let's open it up. We want to figure out what's inside. Um, what I do is, like I said, tear it down, open up the device, figure out, you know, look at what's inside. Uh, if you're dealing with something that you don't know, uh, I find that in some, in some research, I end up with a chip that has no markings. Um, if you can figure out what it does, you, you'll probably need a logic analyzer for this. Um, and SMD microprobes, these are extremely useful for uh, analyzing really uh, chips with really small pitch uh, pins. Um, multimeter, another tool that I constantly use uh, for measuring voltage and measuring, uh, yeah, measuring voltage. Um, so the first thing I do if I'm looking at a chip that I don't know what, what, it, what chip it is and I want to find the data sheet, um, I'll actually mark out all the pins. So I'll, I'll use the multimeter and the continuity test to see what pins are ground, what pins are voltage. Um, I'll also use the logic analyzer to see can I figure out things like does something look like a clock? Does something look like SPI or I squared C communication or UART? If so, I map those out on pins. Um, then I look up data sheets. So I was looking at a drone that had a 2.4, I knew it had 2.4 gigahertz because of the FCC ID, but I didn't know what chip it was. They marked it off. So I started grabbing every 2.4 gigahertz tra transceiver I could find uh, the data sheet for. And I took all the pinouts, I took them from the data sheets, and I just mapped them out uh, in a picture. 
And then I started matching. What of the pins that I know, right? I know clock, I know power, I know ground. What matches up? Only one will typically match up. And then you know the, then you know what you're using. Then you can put your logic analyzer on that. You can see, you can sniff exactly what it's doing. And with that drone, I then figured out the frequency hopping pattern that it was using. So now I can take over any drone of that manufacturer, um, just by mod by modifying the existing drone controller. Um, this is all very inexpensive. It's very easy to do. You just like. There's so much cool stuff that you can break just by testing. Um, but we're supposed to be talking about creating. Okay, a little more breaking. Um, extracting firmware, another way to reveal secrets. This is uh, the inside of a keyboard from a reputable manufacturer uh, that I've extracted the AES firmware from. It uses uh, AES for crypto to, com to con protect the communication. It's a wireless keyboard. Uh, the company starts with an M and ends with a Microsoft. Um, <laughs> when you're opening something like this, you can actually look for test pads, right? Are there pads that they use to uh, program the device? And if you find those, you can typically easily connect to those rather than connecting to the pins on the chip itself. Uh, in this scenario, we see this looks like NRF24L1E, um, which is a Nordic RF uh, system on a chip. It has a micro microcontroller on it there too. And we can actually extract the firmware. They didn't protect. They didn't protect the firmware. So you can extract it. You can extract the AES key. Um, then you can do all sorts of other research. You can modify that. You can use a disassembler or a debugger and actually modify the firmware and then reflash it, um, reprogram it with your own code. So that instead of just looking for your keyboard or looking for your USB dongle, it looks for anyone's. And you can type on anyone's machine who has a Microsoft keyboard. Um, Teensy is an amazing tool that I that I use. Um, I've used it for. I mean, all sorts of stuff, but if you need a microcontroller and you need something fast, um, not so fast that you need FPGA, I use the Teensy. It's, it's small, it's inexpensive. Um, Paul is somewhere around here, and you know, creates such amazing software and hardware. I love it. Uh, let's see how, how we're doing on time. All right. Um, rolling codes. <laughs> uh, rolling codes. So we're talking about car keys and how they work. So when you take your key and you hit unlock for your car, what it's actually doing is it's sending a different code every time. So unlike the fixed code garage, which, se which sends the same code, this is actually rolling. So this way, if an attacker is listening to the radio frequency and picks up, let's say, one of your unlock codes, well, fortunately, it won't work again. So by, by using a random number generator, it changes every time, and the car and the key are in sync. So when you hit unlock, the car knows to move to the next, the next number that your, un that your key fob also knows. Um, so this prevents fixed code replays, replay attacks, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, so the thing about random number generators, they should be difficult to predict. You shouldn't be able to figure out what the next code is. Um, replaying rolling code. So uh, I found an interesting attack. If you can break into somebody's home, grab their clicker, record that signal, hit unlock, record the signal, as long as they're not near the car, then the car didn't hear it and you have that signal that you can then play. It's like a, a one-time password that wasn't used yet. So then you can go out and unlock their car. Of course, that's silly. You've broken into their home. Don't, don't do that. So there's something interesting you can do here. You can actually jam. So what if I go up to a car and I hit the unlock button while, I'm simul while someone is simultaneously jamming the signal? The car will not hear the unlock code. So it will play a code, a one-time use, one use code, but the car will never hear it. So it will basically enter the abyss and they hit it again, and if you're not jamming, the second one will work. However, that first code was still a valid code, it just never got heard. So if you can actually jam using the same exact technology that we built with the CC1110 uh, or 1111, you can simultaneously jam, prevent someone going up to their car and hitting unlock, steal that code with another receiver, and then when they hit unlock again, you can, again, jam, steal that code. Now you have two codes that, are, that you can use to unlock their vehicle. You can replay the first one, and then you have a second one to use at a later time. And you can walk away. You can put this on a simple device, put it under their vehicle, and walk away. And any time you want, you can go back to their vehicle, press a button, it will replay the next code, the code in the future, and unlock their vehicle. It's absolutely crazy. Um, there's so much cool stuff when you're actually looking at the protocols. If you, if you let's say, listen to some of this RF um, communication and you start breaking it down. Let's say you hit unlock a bunch of times and you look at the difference between those packets and you just throw it in Audacity, right? It's an open source wave editor. It's very easy to look at all of this stuff. If you just look at that and then you compare it to, if you hit compare it to lock, 
you'll see that unlock signal to cars and lock signals is a difference in a bit. It's kind of like the chip on your card. It says either one, I have a chip, or zero, I have no chip. Same with unlock and lock. So if you go up to a vehicle and someone hits the lock button and you jam and you sniff that and you use it for later, you can change the lock to an unlock. Literally by flipping a bit, um, just by looking at this stuff. And this stuff has been around for years and years and years and no one has discovered any of this because no one's looked. Um, it's so cool that you can use a $15 piece of equipment like an RTL SDR in your computer in Audacity, open source wave software, download this information, throw it in there and be like, oh, I can unlock any car. Um, absolutely incredible. Here's a, here's a device. For this attack, I use a Teensy 3.1 and I use two CC1101s. Um, it's so simple, right? I use the 20, basically $30 in equipment to create a device that can basically unlock virtually any car. Uh, and as you can see, I just use wires and throw it, throw it together. Um, from here, you can always build, you know, you can build a schematic, you can build your own device. But I love that there's so many people out there who have like spent so much time to create these amazing modules and systems and microcontrollers um, that we can, we can piggyback off of. So when you're implementing attack, this is the fun part. This is how do I make it modular? You know, often I'm using devices that I attach to my computer, like a sniffer or a uh, you know RTL SDR or a Hack RF or an Arduino, uh, maybe a big Arduino Uno or something or a dev kit. How do I make that stuff smaller now? And honestly, it's from learning from you guys, learning from Hackaday.com, learning from all the amazing projects on there. How people have reduced the sizes of, uh, of their projects, different chips you can use that combine radios and microcontrollers together. Um, what are the simplest requirements? What, what's the minimum speed? What's the minimum memory that I need? Um, powers, uh, the size, how big do I need to, how small do I need to make this so that uh, Ben Krasno doesn't know I have this under his car? I'm not sure. Uh, we'll find out. And you know, an example car that you can just unlock um, with a device. Um, feels good. Feels so good. Uh, so these are my favorites. Uh, this was a lot of fun. I think I ran through this talk, but um, the devices I use, I, again, as I said, I'm new to this stuff, and I kind of just reuse the stuff I know, right? It's just, it's familiar, it's easy, it's like a little comfort, comfortable blanket I wear. Um, so I use the Arduino. Uh, I love the Arduino Nano. Um, the Teensy, when I need some more power, when I need some more processing speed, or I need some more memory, um, I love the Teensy. Um, the AT Tiny, when I'm trying to divide, when I'm trying to build something small. If you need more speed, if you are trying to uh, do a man in the middle attack on a drone that's frequency hopping very quickly, you can use an FPGA or a CPLD, like Cool Runner. Um, these things are inexpensive. eBay, eBay, you can get so much cool stuff. When I'm working on something that requires a computer, uh, I don't want to bring my laptop. Um, anything, Raspberry Pi, BeagleBone Black. Uh, if you can put it on your iPhone, you know, jailbreak your iPhone. You can do so much cool stuff on it. You can run TCP dump. You can run any software you want. Um, Android devices are great. Really, it doesn't matter what you're using, right? There's so many amazing tools for the job. Uh, except operating system, you need to use OS 10. That's the only way to ha hack. Just kidding, jeez. Um, <laughs> use whatever you like, right? Linux, Windows, uh, the cool thing is that the, they're all the same underneath, right? You can build anything, you can talk to any protocol, you can talk to any hardware, you can talk to USB, SPI, I squared C, doesn't matter what operating system, it doesn't matter what device, what hardware. Uh, and I, you know, I constantly go back to the Arduino. Every time I'm trying to extract firmware from a chip, I go back to my Arduino. I look at the data sheet for the chip that I'm trying to extract firmware from, and I look at how it, how it communicates. And I just write a simple Arduino program that talks to it. Um, I put everything on GitHub, so if you're ever interested in code and uh, schematics. Logic analyzer, these are so fun. I use the Stalier. Uh, granted, it's a little more expensive than other logic analyzers that are more inexpensive ones, but I love the software. It's, it's really good software. Um, oscilloscope, right, when you're doing some, uh, any USB microscope. Um, stuff that is really important to me um, when I'm attacking stuff, a good soldering iron. Just get a good soldering iron. Spend a hundred bucks, it'll last a long, long time. Um, a hot air gun, uh, a fume fan so you don't get lead up in your system. I keep switching between lead and unleaded because, oh man, unleaded solder. It sucks so bad. <laughs> then my girlfriend gets mad and she's like, that's lead. Um, yeah, you know, razors, tape, sandpaper, snips, wire cutters. It's like, if you have this, you can just break into anything. Absolutely anything, it's incredible. Um, so I think, uh, I think that's all I have. Um, uh, thanks so much. I'll be outside for Q&A.